you, you've already touched on one uh, myth related to the Crusades, this idea that they were essentially born out of this desire of like, what do we do with these second, third, and fourth, fifth sons uh, who, you know, are going to fight each other or have all this kind of, you know, pent up aggression, or whatever, however you want to say that. So let's send them off on a, a crusade. And that sounds like a great solution. Uh, but another myth that you, you point out is this idea that the Crusades were driven by a hatred of Muslims, that this was, um, you know, kind of, and I think when we say something like that, we import all types of baggage that we have now over kind of uh, ethnic wars or wars of religion and, and, and whatnot. Um, so I, I want to start with what what do some of these myths, whether that's the second, third, fourth, you know, uh, fifth born son myth, or perhaps more specifically this idea of the Crusades were at, born out of a hatred for Muslims, what does that get wrong? Yeah, so, you know, it uh, it gets wrong many different things, right? It gets, so uh, just before I answer the question directly, I think I think it's important, and I try to, to emphasize this when I teach, when I give presentations and, and in my writing, is that, you know, it, we have to understand historical events from the perspective of those who participated in them, who lived through them. Uh, and so, and that, that's hard for us to do um, because we have to take our, you know, we have to get out of ourselves, if you will, and kind of get out over or out of our modern mindset and, and put ourselves into a mindset that may be radically different from our own. Um, but I think that's a more, the most effective way to truly understand these historical events. Doesn't mean we agree with them or that we justify them or whatever, just, but it helps us to explain them and understand why people acted the way that they did. Um, you know, centuries and centuries ago. And so in the case of the Crusades, I think it's important for us to be more, very, very important for us to get into the mindset of medieval people and their relationship with, with Christ, the relationship with the church and the society that they had, um, which was, you know, very much linked and integral in, in the faith, in the Christian faith, the Catholic faith. That's not to say that everybody there, you know, was a perfect Catholic or perfect Christian. Obviously, that's not true. Uh, it's not true in any age, right? Um, definitely not true now. But, uh, you know, people aren't that much different. But um, they did understand, you know, their society in a much different way. And so, you know, you do see at the end of the 11th century, especially with the arrival of the Seljuk Turks into the, you know, what was then the Byzantine province of Anatolia, now modern day Turkey, um, and the pressures that those that group of people placed on the Byzantine Empire, if you will, um, and the request for help that they sent to the West uh, to send to, you know, what we call crusaders to them. Um, you know, it was the motivation that, at least for the first crusade, and even we could say for multiple sub subsequent crusades, the motivation was not hatred. The motivation, frankly, was love. I mean, when you read some of these contemporary accounts, chronicles or charters that these individuals left for us when they sold their land to be able to finance their participation in the crusade they told us you know why they were going and it was rooted in i, I like to describe it as in love in three ways right the love for god they literally truly had a deep and abiding love for christ and his church and for god and you know the pope asked them to go on these expeditions and these campaigns and for them that was something that was important and something that was worthwhile to do not everybody obviously but a large number of people thought that and did that um and you know for us i think in some some ways modern people we have we struggle with that and we struggle with really you made this radical life decision rooted in belief in god and you know in your adherence to the church yeah, they did. Um, you know, that's who they were. That's how they believed in many of them, uh, most of them, frankly. And then, you know, it was, so it was love for God. It was love for their neighbor. So reports had been coming back from the Holy Land, from pilgrims from Europe who had gone to the Holy Land and been harassed, um, you know, by Muslims. Not to say that always happened. There were times of great peaceful journeys. But in the 11th century, the violence started to increase and harassment started to increase. Um, and then even just reports of indigenous Christians, you know, living in, in the Holy Land who were being harassed. So those reports of that came back to Europe and influenced people to want to go and to help their fellow, fellow you know, brothers and sisters in Christ to protect them, um, you know, from harassment and from violence and from death. And then also love and concern for themselves, right? They were provided this unique spiritual opportunity to participate in this, what they believed and saw as a pilgrimage. Um, to and, and a penitential pilgrimage at that, which which had certain spiritual privileges attached to it by the Pope, uh, indulgences, you could go and, and receive that. And that was a unique opportunity for most of the people at that time. And so out of a concern for their own salvation and, their, and love for themselves, we could say in a, in, a, in a good way, love for their eternal souls, they left and went and participated in these things. So it wasn't really rooted in 
you know, hatred of Islam. It was, you know, rooted in love for Christ, love for the church, love for their neighbor, love for themselves and concern for their own salvation. Um, recognizing obviously that, you know, Muslims or Islam was, you know, the, the enemy, if you will, or the people that who's you, who were occupying in their minds, ancient Christian territory. And so it was their job and their opportunity, if you will, to go and to liberate that. And that's really helpful. You've written another book, one that I admittedly haven't read, uh, but it, it's titled The Glory of the Crusades, which I think is a, a provocative title in some ways, because I think the knee-jerk reaction for most uh, Christians would be to probably use a maybe less exciting uh, kind of uh, word there, maybe like the shame of the Crusades or something like that. And I'd be curious, so when you, obviously, you know, it's part of that's, I imagine, to catch people's attention, um, but when you... When you say something like the glory of the Crusades, is the glory in the Crusades in their accomplishments or is it in that motivation that you're talking about there out of kind of the the love for their brother Christians? Just, just out of curiosity as someone who hasn't read that book. Yeah, so um, great question. And uh, I addressed that, that question in the book. And so, you know, about why I, I titled the book The Glory, because you're right, the reaction to it was... In many camps, um, you know, there was a, a very emotive and, and knee jerky reaction to the to the use of the word, and and um, yeah, it doesn't. My publisher, I'm sure, didn't didn't mind that it was a little bit, um, you know, if I'm provocative, sure. Um, but what I meant by that, actually, I I use that term specifically uh, for two reasons, really. One is my understanding is is that. Uh, you know, the word, the Hebrew word that's used for glory of God most often in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word kavod. And my understanding of that meaning is that it means something important or, or heavy. Uh, so heavy in weight or something really important. And so I used that term, I chose that term, the glory of the Crusades, because I wanted people to understand that the crusading movement, um, you know, occupied a significant period of time of church history. Um, and, 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 the, and it was an integral movement within the Catholic Church for a, you know, centuries, for depending on how you want to date it, anywhere from 600 to 700 years. Um, and so for part of it is a reaction to what you said, you know, a minute ago about maybe we should call it the shame of the crusade, some people might, might argue. And my counter to that is, well, I mean, no, right? We should, it's not really shameful, but we need to understand. Maybe there's some, not saying that there weren't events that, or activity or actions that occur that were shameful, individual crusaders doing you know crazy wild things, but the um, that it's because this occupies such a long period in time of church history, and it was mo so many people were motivated to go on these crusades, and popes for centuries encouraged people to do so. It's incumbent upon us as Catholics today to truly understand what these events were and why people went. So there's an importance behind it. We can't just bury our head in the proverbial sand, if you will, and just say, well, we're just going to ignore those 700 years of church history and say those were bad and just leave it at that. I, I think that's a cop out, right? We can't do that. It's not honest. Um, so we have to look at these events, honestly. That was one reason I used it. But the other reason is from a quote from Hilar Belloc, who was an English Catholic um, historian, politician, Renaissance man, did all kinds of fun things, but um, interesting man in and of himself. But he wrote a book on the Crusades in the 30s. And so he was writing at a time, right, post-World War I, um, in the, you know, the downfall of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, the establishment of all of these different colonial mandates in the Holy Land. So you had the French in Syria, you had the British in Palestine. And there was a lot, at the time, there were a lot of Crusader imagery that was used by these colonial powers um, in a very, you know, victorious, uh, sense, right? Oh, like we have returned, you know, to the Holy, we've, we've finished what the Crusaders weren't, weren't able to do. We're occupying the Holy Land for, you know, these kinds of things. And Belloc took great umbrage with that terminology and that that imagery. And in his mind, he, he said, yeah, we've returned to this area of the world. We, you know, Europeans have returned to this area of the world, but we returned bankrupt um, from those who came before us in terms of, you know, the, the gloriousness of their lives and the, and the gloriousness of their um, motivation, as you mentioned, which was, you know, a, a faith-filled motivation overwhelmingly. And so he was, he was using uh, the term, right, the glory of the Crusades or the glorious time of the Crusades as a way to kind of, you know, shock his own 20th century world where people were more secular or he saw the rise of secularism and, and a loss of and a lack of faith. And so it's from that quote from Belloc that I also kind of adopted this point. And I think we can also learn a lot um, from these people who went uh, and why they chose to do that, you know, that they risked life and limb 
um, you know, to, to go uh, on this very, very, you know, uh, scary, long, uh, you know, venturesome pilgrimage. And uh, so why did they do it? And the simple answer, you know, that, I mean, I was taught as an undergrad was, well, it was greed, right? It was greed. They were, they were, you know, they wanted money, they wanted land, um, you know, and that just, when you peel back the onion on, the, on that you know, justification, it just doesn't really work. I mean, not, not to say that there weren't some who, who thought they were going to get rich by going on crusade. They quickly found out that was not going to be the case because warfare is expensive no matter what century in which you fight it. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I think that from the gloriness of it, we can learn who these people were, how they saw themselves, how they saw the relationship to Christ and the church. Uh, and we can learn a lot spiritually from them as a result of that. You know, one of the really interesting things about studying church history, and I think your answer has really brought this out, is to see the the gaps in what might have motivated people in the past versus what motivates us today, or what are the things that we take for granted as just simply the way everyone would see things that other people don't share. And oftentimes, you know, C.S. Lewis has that great um, preface to On the Incarnation where he talks about kind of our blind spots, right, and how history helps us. Uh, to kind of trade our blind spots for, for others or, or see our blind spots um, that we so often miss by only looking at our times. And I think the Crusades can do that in a way for us to see that, that these people were maybe motivated by something, if we have a charitable reading of it, that we could ask ourselves, like, are, are we motivated so strongly by, by matters of faith to, to take up such consequential actions? Even And I think someone could get that out of that, even if they did say at the end of the day, you know, maybe I wish this would have gone slightly differently or this would have gone slightly differently, but we can still kind of have that, that charitable engagement and, and try to learn from the past. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this clip. If you did, you'll probably enjoy the full interview too, which you can find here. And if you haven't already, you should consider subscribing, which you can do here. Lastly, if you are bought into the vision of gospel simplicity, which is bringing simplicity out of theological and historical complexity, you can support the channel by going to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity or clicking on the link in the description down below. Thanks. And God bless.